This is my 80th problem solving video about actuarial exam two. Two videos ago, number 78, I derived a differential equation for the outstanding balance on a loan that is being paid back with a continuous payment stream. One video ago, number 79, I solved that differential equation in the case where your payment stream was a proportionality. The, payment, the rate of payment was proportional to the time elapsed. Here in this video, we do another case, solve the differential equation for that outstanding balance on a loan when the continuous payment stream is a linearly decreasing function. So it's the same basic setup as in the last couple of videos. We've got a loan of amount L, interest rate I per period, corresponding equivalent force of interest delta, which would be the natural log of one plus I, repaid with a continuous payment stream, the word stream is not, not in there, but that's assumed, over N periods, could be N years, for example, with rate of payment given by this function right here. And you can see that's a linearly decreasing function of t. If you were to graph it, k sub t as a function of t, its vertical intercept at t equals zero is b, and its horizontal intercept at, uh, on the t-axis is when t equals n. Yeah, the vertical intercept is at b. b is unknown until, well, I tell you what it is here. In part one, confirm that b equals this thing right here. Why is that the value of B? You, not just any B works. We want the loan to be completely paid off at time n. We want this integral to be true. So what we're going to do in part one here is we're going to set the integral equal to L and solve for B. Logically speaking, I should do it the other way. Plug in B into the integral and show that you get L. But um, you know, pretending that you don't know what B is ahead of time, it's, it makes more sense that way to do the integral first. Second part, assuming that we've got, once again, the same rate of payment, we've got that differential equation, just like in the last couple of videos in this initial condition. Use knowledge about solving differential equations. Again, it's going to be integrating factors to show that the formula for the outstanding balance as a function of time can be written in this way. Pretty complicated. Um, probably what's more important is to know what the graph of that looks like. So you can use your technology. You can plug in typical values of these numbers, like L might be 100,000, N might be 30, like for a mortgage. Delta could be, for example, 0 0.05. Plug those things in, in there. The graph ends up looking like this. It's actually decreasing and concave up, which should make some sense here, I hope. Inter intercepts are L and N. The rate of payment is high at first, relatively high, when time is small, and it gets lower and lower and goes down to zero at time N. So that should make sense as to why this is initially decreasing very rapidly and then doesn't decrease so rapidly when you get close to t equals n. In the last video, the graph was concave down. Uh, actually, the outstanding balance went up at first because the rate of payment was so small at first. So that's probably more important than the actual formula itself. As in the last video, we need to recall a formula for a certain kind of integral. It's the integral of t times e to the delta t. I derived that in the last video with integration by parts. Here, let me just write down the answer, although I'm going to write it in a maybe a simpler form as negative e to the negative delta t times in parentheses delta times t plus 1 over delta squared plus c. Though when we do our definite integral, we won't need the plus c because the fundamental theorem of calculus allows us to cancel that anyway. Now let's go ahead and start part one. Let's go ahead and set L equal to this integral. Replace KS with this thing with T equal to S. Now the factor that we're using the letter S instead of T here is not a big deal. Multiply by V to the S, which is the same as E to the negative delta times S. This is, we're gonna set this equal uh, to each other here and solve for B, that's the goal. Show that B must be this. I'm going to go ahead and factor the b out and write what's inside the parentheses as, say, two integrals, which is fine by linearity of integration. 1 times e to the negative delta s is this. And then I subtract, I can also pull out of 1 over n here, the integral from 0 to n of s e to the negative delta s, coming from multiplying these two things right there. I'm ultimately going to solve for b, so whatever this ends up being, I'm going to end up dividing both sides by that. So let's continue to keep the b out in front. This integral here, 
hope you can do fairly quickly in your head is going to be this. This integral, the second integral, I need to use the formula in red here without bothering to put the C. So use this formula with, take the um, T to be S, I'm going to get a negative E to the negative delta S times in parentheses delta S plus 1, all divided by delta squared, evaluate from 0 to n. All right, keep going here. Plug in n, subtract what you get when you plug in 0. E to the 0 is 1, and the two minuses signs make a plus. I get a positive 1 minus e to the negative delta n power, which is the same, by the way, as v to the n. I think I'm going to go ahead and put a v to the n in there right away. You see in this formula, I put a v to the n right there. Uh, these two minus signs can cancel. So I can make a plus 1 over n in parentheses. Plug in s equals n. I, I made the two minus signs cancel, so I'm going to get e to the negative delta n, which I can write as v to the n, and I will eventually here, times in parentheses delta times n plus 1 minus what I get what I get when I plug in 0, or e to the 0 is 1. When I plug 0 into this, I get 1. So I'm going to get a minus 1 all over delta squared. All right, so let's continue simplifying. Let's get a common denominator of delta squared times n, which is good because you see a delta squared times n in the numerator up here. Delta squared times n. Here in this fraction, I need another factor of delta and n in both the top and the bottom. So on top, I end up with delta n minus delta n v to the n. With this one, I already have the denominator delta squared n. I, I distribute the 1 over n through here. So I don't need to do anything to the top. I'm going to get a plus v to the n delta n plus 1 minus 1. And I do get some cancellation. This cancels with the product of these two things. And what's left is a delta n, um, a minus 1, and the product of v to the n and 1 over delta squared n. And yeah, now just multiply both sides by the reciprocal of this. And you will, in fact, get this thing right here. This implies that v is L delta squared n over v to the n plus n delta minus 1. Just rewriting it a little bit. Okay? And, and the logic goes the other way around, so you really can verify it, logically speaking, with the other direction. The logic is reversible. All right, now we're on to part two. The differential equation, once again, let me just let b be the same as ob to simplify things. I'm looking at this differential equation here with a b instead of an ob. And it's traditional uh, to not put a b sub t or a b of t here when you write the differential equation. Minus kt, uh, kt is this thing. So minus b times the uh, 1 minus t over n in parentheses. That is your differential equation, and your initial condition, once again, is b of 0 equals l. So there's the initial value problem to solve. Once again, we rewrite the differential equation by subtracting delta times b from both sides. Once again, we get the integrating factor to be e to the negative delta t in this case. It can be more complicated with more complicated complicated kinds of functions in front of the b there. We multiply both sides of that by this integrating factor. Um, so, And then what we get on the left side ends up being the derivative of the integrating factor times the unknown function. I skipped a step there. It's the product rule that allows you to see that. And on the right we get negative b. I'm going to go ahead and multiply the e to the negative delta t through the parentheses. So I'm going to need to integrate both pieces. e to the negative delta t minus t over n e to the negative delta t. Okay, I think that looks good. Now integrate both sides. 
on the left hand side because of the special method is easy to integrate. The right hand side is a bit trickier, but we can do it here uh, we're after a general antiderivative. Negative b times this thing is going to give me b over delta e to the negative delta t for the antiderivative of that piece there when I multiply these two things. If I multiply these two things and integrate, I once again need my formula from up here. You may want to pause the video and write that down again if you haven't. So now I'm going to come back and use that down here with a factor of positive b over n in front of it. So let me, and up there I got a minus sign, so I'm going to get minus, uh, let's see, it'll be b e to the negative delta t times delta t plus 1 in parentheses over n delta squared, or if you prefer, delta squared times n. Then your integration constant c. I think this is right. I don't see any mistakes. The two minus signs made a plus there, but I have a minus sign there, resulting in the minus sign here. I think this is good. If I want to, by the way, I can replace the e to the negative delta t's with v to the t. I could do the same thing up here, although it'd be 1 plus i to the t in the final answer, because I have positive powers of, of e there and there. All right, solve for b of t by multiplying both sides by e to the positive delta t. The general solution of the differential equation can be written this way. Like that. Now use your initial condition. L is b of zero is b over delta minus, that becomes one when t is zero, I get e over delta squared n plus c times 1. Solve for c. c is l minus b over delta plus b over delta squared times n. Get a common denominator of delta squared times n. Like this. And now for your final answer, take this and plug it back in up here. And it looks like in the final answer, I, I do write everything with a common denominator of delta squared times n. So let's see, b of t, get a common denominator of delta squared n. So I'm here I'm going to get a b delta n up top. Here I already have that denominator, so the top stays the same. Here I have that denominator, but I got to multiply by e to the delta t. Uh, let's see, so I get e to the delta l squared, uh, l delta squared n right here times e to the delta t minus b delta n times e to the delta t plus b e to the delta t all over delta squared times n. We're looking pretty close, like we're basically done. Can we rewrite it in the way that we have up here? You might want to pause the video and write that down. I am now going to go back down and double check that I can write it that way. I would take this term and put it first, L delta squared N E to the delta T. There, let's see, are two more terms that involve E to the delta T, these two terms. They both also involve a B. That can be factored out. B E to the delta T times in parentheses 1 minus what's left from that one is delta N. And then these two terms involve a b that can be factored out. And what's left over, uh, looking here, this part and this part also involve a delta that can be factored out and be left with an n minus t in parentheses. And then we have a minus b. The b is already factored out, so this becomes a minus 1. And this thing right here is the exact same thing as I had up in the problem statement here. Let me double check one more time. I'm looking it over here. Yes, this is correct. So pretty amazing that you can solve for such a complicated formula. But again, really what's more important is the graph. And again, the gra in typical situations, at least the graph looks like this.